So the way that we've looked at it is, is that we look at it as a, or at least the way I've been looking at it, I'll say it that way, okay. is, is that if I have a function that is running on its own, and it only has one purpose to basically turn this one widget or turn this one wheel and it does it on its own, then that's a non, you know, that that's the non, that's non-human identity you know, at work. And that that's how we define it. So therefore it's, you know, it's the Lambda that goes off and does the thing. And then, you know, and then you get an end product and it can't do anything else other than that one thing. But that's the you know that's kind of the overall goal and that's the you know that's where the access and everything that's kind of the guardrails in which it sits on so chris you picked a real easy one for your first topic <laughs> what do you have for number two this is identity at the center if it has anything to do with iam this is the go-to podcast now your hosts Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? Not bad for coming live to you on a Sunday morning. It is a Sunday morning. That's for sure. I think we're both struggling with like allergies or colds or something. I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, I, I figured by this point of the summer... I wouldn't have to worry about allergies, but I checked the weather channel. We're high for ragweed, which is probably the thing that it's, hits me the most. So I'm like breathing through my mouth. So if you hear me gasping, it's because I've been too uh, talking too long. Uh, but what's well, a good reminder complain. to shut up? <laughs> what's that? That's, that's a good reminder to shut up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like if I'm gasping for air, it means I've been talking for too long straight. Exactly. Yeah, so um, scoured LinkedIn last night, um, and you know what a what a treasure trove of ideas. One thing that I I got into was an article um, about the Oklahoma mobile driver's license. Um, that wasn't even on my radar, right? Oklahoma is now moving forward with the mobile driver's license. I feel like every state at some level is moving forward with mobile driver's license, and it definitely feels like it's in the lane of digital identity, don't you think? Well, yeah. I mean, you're you're presenting a credential to say this is who I am. That is absolutely digital identity. <laughs> yeah. It's a new area. I think that a lot of us are, you know, needing to learn. So this goes back to the digital identity versus IAM. You know, our foundation was more in the IAM space, which included customer IAM, so internal, external. But now there's this new newer area around like decentralized identity blockchain stuff like that where you know most of us haven't specialized in but understanding not only the use cases but also the technology i think is is a is a real you know challenge but opportunity i, I kind of feel like overall that's the that's the thing in the digital identity space is what makes this field so exciting is the challenge is is well you constantly things are coming up and things are moving forward where you're having to to learn and figure things out but that's also the exciting part is that it doesn't sit still and it's not static and we're having the opportunity to learn all these new things yeah i mean that's i think that's the natural evolution of any of any role anywhere anytime things move forward <laughs> you've got to stay current um, unless you're a COBOL or mainframe programmer apparently you can like do that work and then I like, go away for a while and then come back and make a ton of money because nobody knows how to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, that's the key as well. It's like sometimes sitting still can work to your benefit, but um, I don't know. That's never been my personality style. <laughs> so um, yeah, but I, you know, we always talk about our conference discount codes. I think we should get into that in a minute, but that's a great way to stay current too, is just going to those conferences you know, we always talk about the hallway conversations and that's such a great value, but actually sitting in the sessions and seeing how people are solving some of these new use cases for identity um, is a way to stay current. And so, you know, to the extent that, you know, you can afford to be, afford to take the time, spend the money to be out of conferences, especially looking for events that are local to you or local enough that it's not a major expenditure. 
uh, I think is great. And of course, you know, having a company that supports that is great as well. You know, our guest today kind of ties together the two points I was making because we see him at a lot of conferences. So obviously his organization has seen the value, sees the value in um, sending him to conferences. And that's how we've, um, you know, built a contact. And I, I think a friendship as well. Um, but also, um, you know, just the idea of like being out of conferences and, and learning all these new topics and then taking the position of, you know, wanting to share that information with the rest of the community. So I think that's, you know, what you get out of conferences. Yeah, let's talk about those conference discount codes. We've got Identity Week. We've got the America and the Asia Conference both coming up here. You and I are going to be at the Identity Week America in Washington, D.C. on September 11th and 12th. Uh, we're going to be doing podcast stuff, but I'm actually also hosting uh, like an hour of identity and access management talks and a panel and stuff like that. So uh, still working through the details on that, but I have volunteered uh, to do that. So if you use the code IGAC30, you get 30% off of your registration. And that code works for both the U.S. and the Asia shows. So if you're going to one or both, feel free to use that code. Good free way to save some money and show support for the show. The other one we've got coming up is the Authenticate Conference from the Fido Alliance. Uh, that is October 14th through the 16th in Carlsbad, California, which awesome weather. Love it. Um, we were there last year, and I think we've been to the last few Authenticates at this point, but we have a discount code for that one as well. IDAC15, IDAC15 gets you 15% off of your registration. So you and I are going to be at that one too. Um, I know that there's a meeting. I think I think we had to reschedule a couple of times, but there's one probably next week <laughs> uh, to kind of talk through a little more kind of what we're going to be doing, some of the ideas we had for for doing shows there. But yeah, looking I'm forward to Andrew Shikiar as the guest on an upcoming episode. I think the next episode. Yeah, I think he's the reigning champion right now on number of um, you know appearances on this, and we're yeah, always we had happy him to on during our Deniverse. We had him on during our Deniverse, and I think that was number eight. So he's looking at episode number nine. So it's not only in the lead, but he's got a couple. He's lapped people a few times now. Well, he, you know, Saturday Night Live does like a, you know, five timers club with like a, you know, like a smoking jacket type thing. And you're all about those, you know, flashy jackets. I want to know what you're going to do for if someone makes it to 10 episodes on what, what are we going to do about that? Take one of my uh, classy jackets and, <laughs> and throw an identity at the center sticker on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that is a gym answer if i've ever heard one <laughs> that's weak sauce right all right well we can come up with something yeah something we'll come up with better something. than that all right well why don't we get to our main topic and our main and only guest today i guess <laughs> his name is chris power he's a senior manager of identity and access management at sally may he's been with us before all the way back on episode 162 where i believe that's the first time at least i remember, remember meeting chris and we had a nice little kind of um, conversation up in the sweet suite, if you remember that, at Gartner. At, was at Caesars uh, a few years back. Got yeah. to know got to know Chris there a little bit. But welcome back to the show, Chris. I'll say thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and you know, I'll say it's it it's been a long ride, but it's been a fun ride for the last two years. Getting you know getting you know going from that and getting to know you you know getting to know you too, and of course the the identity space a lot better over the last two years through those conferences. Yeah, and speaking of conferences, this is actually technically your third appearance on the show because you, when we were at the Identiverse conference earlier this year, we had kind of like a Q and A with Andrew Shikiar asking some questions about passwordless and, and authentication, just Fido in general. And I believe you stepped up to the microphone in our little kind of area that we were recording and actually asked a question. So if you recognize the voice, there you go. Uh, you, this is technically your third time on the show. I'm shooting for 10. I'm shooting for 10, Jeff. I want, I, I want to, you know, I, I want to get a, I want to get a jacket. That's, that's when you know, that's my goal now. <laughs> you want Jim's leftover jacket with a hastily applied identity center sticker <laughs> applied to it. <laughs> and uh, a marker writing number 10 on the back. <laughs> that's right. Um, Chris, people in the U S might be familiar with Sally May, but I always like to talk about, you know, we talk about this as a global audience not everyone's familiar with what Sally May does. Why don't we start with that? Tell us a little bit about what Sally May does, and then I'd love to just kind of hear about your role at Sally May. You know, what does a senior manager of identity and access management do for an organization like that? 
Well, Sally Mae is a you know Sally Mae is a private student loan provider. We you know we help yeah you know, we help individuals get through you know get through their journey of you know getting a better education through various you know through various colleges and universities by providing ways to get you, you know, ways to get you your you know, the funding that you need to get from you know from one point in your journey to the next. From from an IAM standpoint, you know standpoint what. I've been doing and what you know what I work with primarily is the is on the inside of the house the workforce management side of Sally May. So everything from the B to you know, B2B and to the individual employees to contractors that we use on a day-to-day -day basis helping manage the you know helping manage their access is kind of is my you know is my bread and butter is what I focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as a senior op, you know, as a senior, you know, IAM operations manager, my role is to help manage a team of roughly 10 people who spend their days taking care of the, what I call the pillars of IAM from a workforce management side of things. That's, that's the governance of the house, you know, doing cert, you know, doing regular access certifications on a quarterly basis, taking care of, you know, taking care of the day-to-day -day provisioning of access, joiners, movers, leavers, all the, you know, basically through the entire life cycle, as well as taking care of just, you know, overall just day-to-day -day aspects of what the workforce needs to be able to get into their, you know, to be able to get into their individual applications, helping, you know, helping our, you know, helping our teams, you know, make those connections between new vendors and new applications, getting them, you know, getting them onboarded into our systems. So, Chris, you you're actually you're really living the identity and access management life, right? So you're you're in there, and I saw your LinkedIn post last night. Actually, I'm not sure how old it was at that point, uh, but you're out there now committing to blog about identity and access management topics for the betterment of kind of like um, paying it forward, right? I think is the the right, the, the fancy way to say it these days, getting this, you know, at least your opinions out there on many different topics. You started with your first blog, which was kind of just saying, I'm going to do this thing. So now the commitment's out there. And I hit you up and said, hey, the commitment's out there. How would you like to come on the Identity Center podcast and kind of talk about what some of these topics we can expect to see you blogging about? So um, maybe you could kind of walk us through a few of those. Let's start with the first one. What was the hottest topic that you have in mind for, for blog number one? So blog number one, I think, is going to be around maturing the non-human identity. That, you know, we, you know, we've been going through a quite a process lately and been talking about it a lot internally for the you know, for last several months, really for a little over a year, on how to properly manage and maintain a you know you know a listing of all of our access that doesn't belong to a human being doesn't actually you know isn't connected to a contractor or an, an employee here at Sally. Uh, with that, we've you know we've had you know we've actually had our own database that we've been using for quite some time to basically kind of we've homegrown our own system so to speak to basically take care of that for the you know for the you know for the last several years. And lovingly, we would like to, you know, we would like to kind of put that to bed and actually try to see what the next level of, you know, what the next level of that looks like. So much like when we, you know, when we saw each other at a dinnerverse, that's, that was kind of one of my main purposes of being there was, is to stroll the vendor hall and kind of get, a, you know, you know, get a better feeling of what, what was out there in that space. And what I found was, is that it's, it's a lot more mature than I thought it was. But yet I also, yeah, but talking to them, I also recognize that there was a lot of room for, you know, that they, they all know that there's still a lot of room for growth. There's still a lot of room for, for standardization and for governance around it. And that's, I'm going to say, that's what I've been, you know, really that's what I've been researching lately. And that's kind of, that's where my, you know, that's where my next set of articles are going to go towards is, is basically that research and kind of the, you know, what I've acknowledged or what I picked up to, like Jim said, pay it forward. So in, you know, in line with that, you know, Jim, I'm going to kind of throw this back at you a little bit. When you think about non-human identity, what do you, you know, what do you think is probably the most important things to look forward to or look into? So you're talking about the, the non-identity space right at the moment. So, um, you know, I, I want to first kind of 
put uh, put on the table a thought that I've been having recently, which was around this crowd strike outage that we all kind of like experienced at some level. And I'm not sure how how badly that hit you, but one thing that I thought about is that we have all these machines now going out and performing updates, and it got me thinking about you know the the whole solar winds thing that happened what was it a year and a half two years ago now um, where we have powerful machine accounts in the environment that we just say okay they have a legitimate requirement to exist and they do these things and so from an identity and access management standpoint we say they're legitimate and the business tells us they need them so we're okay with that and that's that. I think as cybersecurity professionals as a whole, we need to know what our risk is relative to those items, right? I, or to those uh, non-human accounts. I don't know that we necessarily have the technology right now to catch something like that on the fly to um, necessarily have controls that could prevent a solar gate or prevent what happened with CrowdStrike. But I certainly think we need to do a better job of inventorying where our risks are relative to these accounts. I don't think that a lot of people even understand all the accounts that exist um, and, you know, have a way to kind of like, all right, well, you know, it, again, it's kind of like what I say is it's hard to manage what you can't measure. Do we have that measurement of those accounts of the risk relative to these powerful non-human identity accounts? So I think that's one big topic that I've been thinking on that I'm out there looking for. You know, people tell me, no, you're wrong, Jim. We are doing that, or that's not important to do, or yes, you're right. That is something we need to get our arms around, and here's a framework for doing it. Um, I think the second thing overall that makes non-human accounts, you know, one of the things we keep hearing in the industry is that non-human accounts now outnumber human accounts. So I think you're very much on to a, a topic that is, you know, absolutely critical. And I don't see that going back the other way. I only see it getting, you know, bigger and becoming bigger and bigger of a problem to solve in terms of we're doing more and more automation and that requires more and more non-human accounts that can go about, you know, carrying out these activities. And so I think you have the traditional Windows service accounts. And if what I'd encourage people to do is like not look at like that as the entire problem, because I, you know, I feel like in the past, I didn't access management and said, okay, you've got these Windows service accounts and that's 75% of the problem. And then you've got these applications and Linux situations where, you know, maybe somebody hard coded an account and it's like, that's 10 year old thinking. You've got to also think now about the whole DevOps environment and how accounts are being used to build infrastructure and deploy applications. And what is the risk of those accounts? Um, and then robotic process automation. So there, there's just like a much, bigger picture of non-human accounts. And I think the, the first thing is really understanding the landscape. And then the second is understanding the use cases for those accounts and then applying controls in a proper way. So I'll stop there and kind of see what, what Jeff is thinking. Look, this isn't a new problem. These accounts have been here forever. Since the dawn of IT, <laughs> there's been service accounts. I think... Yes, it's going to proliferate, but to that I don't I just don't see this as a new problem. This is this is forever. Now, the technology has probably gotten better to the point where it's easier to manage and track these things, but I still believe this is a governance first issue. These didn't just start popping up when AI was invented, <laughs> right, or things like that. Uh, there has been service accounts for for as far back. I think this is where we fall back on policy and standards and procedures to say, okay, we've created a service account. Here is the purpose for it. Do we have good metadata around it? Who's responsible for it? You know, is it being used for its intended purpose or did we share it and use it for another service that, oh, this looks like it's similar. 
you know, let's, let's just reuse it for that kind of thing. Uh, I'm hopeful that some of these new technologies in the non-human identity space will be able to dissect that a little bit, but I find that really difficult onion to kind of peel to say, okay, um, you know, how, how is it going to know who it, who it belongs to, right? There's no human identifier tag to it. You're going to have, you're still going to have to go through a process to say, okay, Chris, you've got these, you know, 50 different service accounts that you're using to run your, your applications or your services in your environment. Tell me about them. What do they do? Are they scoped correctly from a permission standpoint? Or did we just say, well, let's give them domain admin and they can do whatever they want. <laughs> so I think there will be a lot of business conversations uh, and helping the business, and the business in this case might be IT, understand, you know, how, how what, you know, what is the risk associated with these accounts? What are you using them for? Do we still need them? Because a lot of times these service accounts or other types of non-human identity stick around forever because we're afraid to remove them or disable them because, oh, it might break something. And the next thing you know, you've got a whole bunch of little, you know, micro perforations in your identity wall where if one of these accounts were to get breached, you'd be able to come through and do whatever you need to do. So I, it is interesting. Um, I think this is a topic that is definitely becoming more important, especially with, you know, the more automation we do some things. But I'm curious to see, Chris, where, where you think this is heading. And if you've seen any specific products or things like that, that or capabilities, maybe that might be like, Ooh, yeah, that's, I need that to, to make my program yeah, and more I, effectively. If I could, Jeff, I just wanted to follow up with one other point that I forgot to mention, which is, you know, service accounts traditionally have weak authentication controls, right? They're not eligible for multi-factor authentication. So if somebody could enter the network with those accounts, that's a big problem. And then of course, if they have very simple passwords that, you know, if you're relying on password only uh, or certificate only, but let's say per password only, you know, you've got to make that as difficult and not guessable as possible and be rotating those passwords if possible so that no human being it was the, even within your organization knows the password. So I agree with everything that, you know, that Jim and Jeff, you're saying, they're going to say, we're definitely, you know, we're definitely taking a look at it from a governance point of view first, you know, first and foremost, to kind of go along with what Jeff was you know, talking about. We've been, you know, I've been doing research. There's, you know, you know, not to name drop too much, but like on LinkedIn, there's actually a non-human identity organization that's kind of being founded, you know, founded out there. They have their own website that basically kind of is, is beginning to bring awareness up to, you know, up on what, what a non-human identity is and how to kind of, how to start building controls around it. And I, you know, I really appreciate what they, you know, the work that they've been doing as well as I think that NIST actually is beginning to take their first swings at it, trying to, you know, trying to get, you know, trying to get the details down of what, you know, a, what a, a non, they call it, I believe they call it an, an NPE, a non-person, you know, entity is, and try to go in, try to get into that. So there's been, you know, that's the research that I've been looking into on that end, as well as knowing full well that the you know the auditors you know the auditors and the GRC groups that we work with are very 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 interested in trying to you know trying to figure out how to how to say that you know how to build controls around it in the sense of saying can we get to the points of an an application identity only having one one select purpose so therefore you know when it you know when it kind of leaves its boundaries or leaves its area of expertise or it gets overscoped or overused in some way Again, bringing us back to identity and that into the whole space of least privileged. How do we just cut, how do we keep it in its own swim lane and keep it going? Hey, Chris, let me follow up with one more thing because you just triggered something. So you talked about governing these non-human identities, which brings me to the question is, is there such a thing as a non-human identity? And I think most people answer the question, yes, but is it a non-human identity or are there non-human accounts? Because from a governance standpoint, I think somebody's got to own these accounts. I don't really think they are identities. I think identities are like the people process. And, and now maybe with AI, we get into the point where there's actually intelligence enough to say, okay, that's an identity. It can do the activities that a human being would do in an intelligent enough way to say, yes, this account is still required. Yes, that is still least privileged 
for this account. But I think that's what an identity does. I think an account is really what we're what exists for the most part today. And those accounts or the process that creates those accounts needs to be owned by a human being. What are your thoughts there? I absolutely agree. I mean, the way that we, you know, the way that we currently manage them and the way we're, we'll manage them in the future, absolutely, that there will be owners involved and, you know, owners for each of those individual applications, be it an IT business owner or an IT technical owner in some way, you know, and, and they do, you know, and they get, they get applied through certification processes, just like, any, you know, just like any, you know, any other account that we, you know, any other account that we handle. So they, they get reviewed for what they can do. So, so I have for topic number. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. I, I slightly disagree here. <laughs> so I think absolutely any account can have an identity associated with it. So if we're talking about a, let's just call it machine account, right? Non-human. It's in the name, non-human identity. This is what we're talking about. <laughs> so we're saying, okay, this account belongs to some entity that is performing some sort of transaction or action. That entity can be human or cannot be human. And in the case of a non-human entity or identity, that we, we definitely need to have ownership assigned to that. But I don't know if it's necessarily a person. It may be another entity that is responsible for that account. IT is responsible for this non-human identity. The identity and access management team is responsible for this specific identity or marketing or e-commerce or whatever it may be. And I think as these non-human identities start to evolve and become more, well, dare I say it, self-aware, <laughs> there may be some associate with that to say, okay, well, uh, Cortana, right? Let's call it that, or in the Microsoft parlance, if you're a Halo fan or whatever, you know, there's probably a whole bunch of different service accounts that run underneath the non-human identity called Cortana. Now, Cortana might belong to, you know, an IT organization or an AI department within it. So I... I can see the argument to be made to say, no, these are these are identities. The, it's just that we have to wrap our head around a different way of thinking about it. It's not just human or, or non-human. It's there is an account. What is its identity? Sure, certainly, if we don't have a strategy around it, it, it just might be a loose collection of accounts that are just, you know, these belong to IT. You, whoever runs Active Directory, here you go. You guys figure it out, <laughs> right? But I can I, I can, I feel like I have to make the case for we need to think about this more strategically in broader terms. Okay, we're talking about logical constructs here, an identity, an account, you know, ownership or responsible party, right? Things like that. And I, I don't always see a one-to-one -one match that it's human to non-human or vice versa. So the way that we've looked at it is, is that we look at it as a, or at least the way I've been looking at it, I'll say it that way, is, is that if I have a function that is running on its own and it only has one purpose to basically turn this one widget or turn this one wheel and it does it on its own, then that's a non, you know, that that's the non, that's non-human identity, you know, at work. And that, that's how we define it. So therefore it's, you know, it's the Lambda that goes off and does the thing and then, you know, and then you get an end product and it can't do anything else other than that one thing. But, that's the, you know, that's kind of the overall goal. And that's the, you know, that's where the access and everything, that's kind of the guardrails in which it sits on. So Chris, you picked a real easy one for your first topic. <laughs> what do you have for number two? Well, number two, I want to say I would be interested in hearing more about the, another topic that's, you know, top of mind to me is, is, is the identity is the IAM space moving away from RBAC? Is RBAC something that I I recognize that RBAC is going to be around for quite some time? This is not like you know I forget I forget the particular tool like you know you know SAML that, that we talk about is getting, getting ready to die or SAML's dead when we when we go to the you know, identiverse. But instead of that you know instead of in that in sense. Is the hourglass turned over on our back in which we are now kind of working our way to sunsetting our back? Are we at the beginning of that and moving towards a policy, you know, moving more towards a policy access control instead? Personally, what I run into is, is that, you know, is what I run into is, is that we've been too connected and too heavily reliant 
on our, for example, HR, you know, basically our HR systems and our HR data. So therefore it is, it's great that, you know, that that is the beginning of, you know, identity, but using, you know, but using that, you know, using that identity information as kind of the foundational layer has become, has become more challenging because HR systems and HR groups and benefits groups and all the other groups that are out there that basically interact, that interact with that data have decided to start architecturing it differently, have, you know, have started using it in different ways and have put a different lens on it. So I, you know, so when they decide to make big sweeping changes, it affects my, you know, it affects my R back. So therefore at this point, I'm looking at it more in a curious state of should we, you know, should, you know, has the industry kind of acknowledged that, you know, that those things do happen or those things are beginning to happen. And maybe we should start breadcrumbing basically our policy, you know, our policy engine to take, you know, to basically take care of these things instead. Sure. Still use that, that workforce management application or that human, re, you know, human resources, you know, data that comes in, but use it as a metadata or use it as an attribute on top of it. To, or as a you know as a site as a note to it to be able to say okay if you're you know if you belong to this department you get this limited amount of access and then you work for this manager you get this little bit more access and then your title says this okay you get this now that you have those things then we start talking about the denies we start talking about because you have you know, because you are in these departments and in these things, maybe you don't need to see all this other types of access that's out there, and maybe you shouldn't because of toxic combinations. You shouldn't be able to get into these things at all either. I'm curious if you're seeing more growth in that space. I think the um, the R back hourglass has been perpetually tipped on its side, cracked with little pieces of sand falling out of it for a very long time. <laughs> I can't think of too many IAM constructs that have such a, a positive, that could have a positive thing on access that has been so poorly implemented and just addressed by not only the market, but the organizations that try to leverage as well. I see so many organizations that struggle with RBAC in general because it's become way too complicated for organizations to actively you know, perform the exercise of creating the roles in a way that makes sense is scalable and they can actually keep up with it. Most organizations that I've talked to and have seen got down the road of maybe six months to a year into it and they're like, oh, this sucks. Forget it. <laughs> Good, do something else. Um, so I think there are, and I think this is, this is where things like policy based, attribute based, you know, other types of, you know, back <laughs> have come along to try and fill in the cracks around this. The, the, the idea of RBAC sounds great on paper until it hits the real world and you have a real organization that has hundreds of applications, hundreds of different types of metadata available at your people, job titles, you know, physical location, um, you know, job codes that don't match with titles. The, you know, the organization doesn't recognize a difference between a manager, a supervisor, a director, or an analyst in one for or one part of the of the uh, company versus an analyst and another, and so what are you left with? You're left with these alternatives to try and fill in the cracks around RBAC. Now, when I look at RBAC, I think, okay, that's a great that's a great goal to have. But why don't we start with something easier like attribute based? Are you an employee or not? That should be hopefully a very simple question and answer. Sometimes it's not, <laughs> but can we at least agree on who is an employee versus? a, you know, a contractor or a customer or whatever the, you know, the persona might be. And I think if you can layer different attributes together, then you have a little bit better chance of starting to put together a access control model that is actually effective, scalable, and an IAM or an IT team who's responsible for this type of stuff can actually live with it. So I feel like this is a soapbox I get on a lot, but I... I, I just feel like RBAC is one of the, you know, under, underutilized because it was so difficult and such a good idea. And the promise was, well, I'm just going to put my IJ tool in there and it's going to do role scanning for me and fix all this for us. 
I haven't seen it work that well. <laughs> and I live and breathe this stuff all the time. So I, I feel like that's my, my two cents on it. So I'm going to stop off my soapbox and ask Jim what he thinks. I think authorization is a difficult topic. I mean, you know, we, authentication used to be a difficult topic, right? When you had all these web applications and fat applications and, you know, they were using um, different technologies for managing authentication, different authentication was being mixed with coarse grained authorization. And then along came SAML and it just became a standard that it was just easier to live by. It's like, let's get people into the application, then let the application handle authorization. So now, now we kind of think authentication is way easier than authorization. And I do, I think even before SAML, that was true. Now, when you take authorization, you have some applications where it's like, there's a list of finite, a finite list of roles and you put a person into those roles. And then you have other applications take your ERP platforms or take custom built applications where the authorization model is tremendously complex. Now, you know, when you take something like RBAC, which, you know, I think our tendency is to say, well, how can I solve all this problem with RBAC? And I don't think that's the answer. But I do think there is a place for RBAC. I think especially for, um, and I, I think RBAC and ABAC, they kind of combine, because you can get into the same conversation with what Jeff was saying is like, are you an employee or not? Well, you can create roles that trigger off of that attribute in your IGA system, for example, and say, all right, we're getting the this feed from the HR system that you are employees. We're going to create a role called employees, and we're going to provision certain birthright access for employees. So I still think whether it's ABAC or RBAC, it kind of accomplishes the same thing. But when it gets to some of these real complex applications, I think the the utility of RBAC breaks down. Now, could PBAC um, help solve this problem? Potentially. Um, but I think even when you get to these big ERP systems, really becomes a matter of people caring about homogenizing the different types of access that can be um, provisioned, right? So that there are different types of people within that system. So you can get closer to that finite list of roles rather than everybody having an ad hoc, um, you know, access to that application, an ad hoc compilation of attributes and permissions within that app. As long as you're allowing that, I don't think any back model um, will really work. So it, it, the hard work is also on the application or platform side in terms of homogenizing authorization so that it can fit some type of model. So you say homogenizing application to, you know, applications together. My curiosity there kind of peaks a little bit because with the new, with SaaS applications and with all the different applications coming in from different areas, it's homogenizing doesn't seem to be the thing that is happening. You know, there, there, that's the part that we're, that's the part that we're missing. I, you know, there, we spend a, you know, we've been working on our back for six plus years at this point. We, you know, and been, you know, been building it out as best we can. And it's, it always still comes down to, well, no, that application doesn't, you know, doesn't have that type of granularity to it. It's that's not an option. So there's a, there's a balancing act that has to happen between systems that allow you to handle front door access, essentially that, 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 in, you know, that entry level access to the application, but then does, doesn't have the APIs or doesn't have the connectors to do individual, you know, to get into the granularity, you actually have to go to the, you actually have to go to a portal or whatnot to be able to get that access, you know, get that access figured out further. Do you, with, you know, in those scenarios, are you, are you still seeing a situation where you want to bring in, you know, where you, where you want to actually have, you know, where you want to actually have somebody 
build out, you know, you know, basically you know, like business owners build out that access or build out, you know, build out how that works. I think it's ultimately what it comes down to, right? So if you're implementing something like an ERP system within your organization, even though the ERP system might be able to handle, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of permutations of what an, um, a full set of authorizations could be, you can still have the discipline within your organization to say, we're only going to do these this 10 types or these hundred types, which really like, these are the important fields that we want to drive access based on. Now, understand I'm, I'm, that might not be appropriate in all cases I, because I think the biggest thing pulling against um, any kind of role model or, you know, when you try to make authorization simpler and by making it simpler, you're going to say, well, you know, 90% of the people that need this access need these things. So let's just give it to 100%. That is not least privilege. You know, at least it's not a black and white view of what least privilege is, because black and white view of least privilege is you only get the access that you need. So if we're giving you access that you don't need because it's more convenient, I'm sorry, that's not least privilege. I know that it might be just an academic argument, but I mean, that's the reality in my opinion. Since there isn't going to be that, you know, that, that standard for the next, you know, that won't, that won't occur for the next five, 10, 15 years, if we're being optimistic, I think that's what's driving me to policy because policy is more customized, policy is more a JSON statement or an XLML statement of some sort that I can take and I can actually put in my if and thens and whiles into the, into it. I hope that, you know, I hope maybe in the future in that, you know, in that standardization that you're talking about, we'll actually, you know, we'll take that into consideration and use, you know, kind of use that as kind of the, the backbone of it. Gee, Chris, it looks like you're uh, picking some real easy ones to start off with. <laughs> so I know you had at least three in mind already. Sure. So let's take a step back. So I know that I, you know, I've, I've, I've hit you with, you know, I did, you know, with the non-human identities and got into the granularity there. I know we've been, and then we just got done talking about, you know, about policy and our back. Why don't we talk about the team for a little bit, you know, you know, a little bit at this point, what, you know, going to Identiverse and going to different conferences and talking, you know, to, you know, and talking to dozens and dozens of people at this point and kind of getting into their stories and getting into what the, you know, how their, I, not their IAM teams work. What I find most interesting is, is how different we really all are. We all feel like we're doing the same thing. We all feel like we're basically heading in the same direction and trying to go after the same things, but our, you know, our mode of transportation or our, you know, our group that we're using to get there is so vastly different. Uh, and another article that I'm going to be working up is, is going into, you know, kind of going into that there's, you know, there are groups, there are, there are businesses out there that of course focus on all the different pieces, but you know, they, you know, that in the end you have to kind of have all the different elements, but the question is, is do you have a dedicated team to any one particular area? How, how heavyweight or lightweight do you go and into, into each one? Personally, we're, a, you know, we're a governance shop. We're, you know, we're very much there to help the business and they're very much there to enact what, you know, you know, to kind of, you know, enact whatever, you know, enact whatever controls that are around it. That's kind of where our heavyweight is. And then we work toward then, you know, and then we do, you know, we help facilitate that through taking care of the day-to-day -day provisioning. But with that, I'm learning, you know, I'm learning that there's not just, you know, there are teams out there or there are departments out there and other organizations that solely focus on governance and then solely focus on provisioning. And then I'm finding out about new groups that are being spun up, especially with this latest, you know, this latest trip to Identiverse that are focusing on the cybersecurity side, you know, the more cybersecurity focused side of it, being able to find phishing, you know, trying to define and trying to build out phishing resistant IAM accounts or, you know, identity accounts. 
And then there's the cloud teams that are trying to help the DevOps groups keep their infrastructure up and running and keeping this, you know, the spin up and spin down and the keys that go along with it up and, you know, up and running. These are all things that, you know, I'm, I'm at the kind of the beginning of that journey of understanding that they're, you know, we don't, as an operations team, we don't have to do it all. We have to do what's most important to our, you know, what, what's most important to our individual groups. And then, you know, but making sure that each one of those are touched in some way, form or fashion by someone within the organization. How do you, you know, do we feel as though that that's the way, you know, you know, I, I'm so used to the idea of, you know, everybody kind of just knows where they're going. It knows, you know, knows the mode that they're running in. Sure. You know, whether or not you want pepperoni on your pizza or you, whether or not you want sausage, you kind of like, you make some, you make some little variations, but for the most part, it's still pizza in the end. Using a bad analogy at this point, I admit. Especially but, around lunch. Especially <laughs> around lunch. But a delicious but, one. <laughs> but is that, is there going to be different, is, is there going to be bigger changes than this? Or is it, you know, or do you see this being, or you see those being still being the core, you know, the core pieces of it going forward? Is there, where, what should I be looking out for as far as, as an operations manager of IAM, kind of the doers of IAM, what, what should I be looking out for? I think I'll go first. So I think you're getting into organizational design, which is somewhat or very specific to the organization, which has a lot to do with the size of the organization, how geographically um, dispersed, um, whether or not IAM is completely a central service or if it's more localized to where the people are. Um, but I think we can make some general assumptions or talk about some general topics there. You know, I think that um, one thing you have to look out for is because, especially in this identity space, if you design your organization around, all right, this is the product that we use for governance and start just fixating on, okay, the product can solve these problems. And now there's another team that is really focused on another product that handles authentication maybe, or another product that handles sing, um, privilege access management. So I think those are the big three with it when it comes to internal identity or workforce identity. Now the products are starting to, to encroach in each other's space and what you, and you, have the potential for is that if you take a product view of the world that then you start doing things, doing the same services within each other. And I think that's a real danger. So I think the teams, if you have separate teams supporting those, um, that you're doing offsite workshops or something. So those teams are collaborating on, okay, what is our strategy going forward for each of these teams to support? And where do we know where our lines of demarcation are? I think that's very important in a very large organization where these different domains are being covered by different groups. I think what I see more often is smaller teams where people are cross-trained across the groups and they're working within those groups, especially on the, not as much on the operation side necessarily, even though I do see that on the operation side as well. Um, but build side and certainly like the architect level where they're doing the, the big time planning of how all these tools work together. But I think that is very important is not to get just locked into uh, too focused of a picture. Um, yeah. What do you have, Jeff? Yeah. And I agree with you. It's, this is mostly organizational design. I think this is the classic centralized versus decentralized strategy that a lot of organizations might be looking at of, well, how do we handle our IAM functions? Do we try to build a central team that kind of does it all and separate that from the business? Or do we allow the business to administrate their own applications as long as they hopefully <laughs> adhere to whatever standards or policies have been set up by a central organization? Uh, and, and I don't think the answer is you know right or wrong either way. It really is a very personal decision for the organization. A lot of it comes down to the people within the organization it's, itself, you know, where where do your skill sets lie? You know, is Active Directory an IAM tool or is that IT infrastructure? Most organizations, AD has been there forever. And so there's like an, you know, a general IT or network group that kind of handles 
the Active Directory stuff, and maybe you have a different team that does your IGA platform or privilege access, or whatever it may be. So uh, I think it's an interesting you know, discussion to have because I think this is one of those things where you have, if I had to guess, Chris, when you write this, the comments are going to kind of fall into two different camps of a more centralized approach and a more of a you know governance decentralized type approach. And you know, nobody's going to be wrong and nobody's going to be right. It's just like, well, here's what works for our organization or <laughs> well, hopefully it works for our organization. Some organizations, you know, maybe they could stand to be a little more centralized and, you know, or at least put out together, you know, put better policies or standards or maybe And I think this is where I am program management becomes so much more important when you're dealing with multiple areas of the business that are not directly underneath, you know, your control as an identity person or even as an IT person. So I think, It'll be, I'd be curious to see what, what feedback comes through for, for, for that article. Yeah, I agree with you both as, you know, not surprising. And let's say, and Jeff, you, I think you, you know, what you said really, you know, rings true to me is because, you know, active directory is an, you know, is an IT function is, you know, is, is, you know, in our cases is an IT, you know, is an IT function, but who takes care of the day, you know, the care and feeding of, you know, active directory, we do, you know, and we're on. We're underneath the, you know, we're underneath the security side of the, you know, side of the house. There's so much, it's so, you know, it's so interesting to me. And, you know, in the last three years of being in this position of, of trying to learn that my, you know, that I have different audiences that I have to, you know, that, yeah you know, that we have to work together with to be able to get, you know, to get identity handled, you know, handled properly. There's how do I, you know. How do I talk SLAs to the business and then talk about, you know, how does single sign on actually work in the background to the, you know, to the IT side of the house and what, you know, and, and what, you know, and their concerns with it while then keeping a balancing act of my, you know, of my stakeholders in security asking the question of, well, can we make sure that we know that this guy really is in California or is he in New York? Let's let you know. Let's let's know who where the right answer of that you know the location of these users are. It's a it's a it's an interesting interesting challenge. You know, another thing you brought up in your question or your your topic, Chris, was are some of these things going to go away? And I don't know if you were hinting at like okay, AI is going to do these things for us because it, look, if AI does, if five years down the road, we're not just allowing business users to go into AI and say, I need to re run a recertification campaign of all of my users who use this application. And I want to send that to this manager or the person's manager or whatever, and basically use prompt engineering to construct their own access certification. If that's not available in five years, like what has AI really done, right? I mean, that should definitely be available in five years. And I got to think IGA companies know that if, if they're not doing that, someone's gonna, going to come along and invent that. So, yeah, I think some of these jobs that, you know, I remember when I ran the IAM program for a bank, we had a person completely dedicated to running access certifications and managing access certifications that were in flight. Once those were all done, generating the reports and getting the next round started so that we could attest to um, access on a quarterly basis. Those things had better go away, right? I still do have that guy, that guy you're talking about who does the quarterly certifications that we do function as a bank. So therefore, you know, I do have that person on my team that that they really do, or they do run access certifications day in and day out, night in and night out, trying to, trying to help manage, you know, trying to help manage that expectation. I've been, you know, we are of course, you know, interested in AI and kind of looking into what, you know, what AI can do, but as a side note or tangent, I've been looking at it as a, really as a, as a big data model kind of scenario, more than, a, you know, no, more than necessarily an AI one. It's how do I take the, yeah, you know, how do I take not only my IGA data, but my service now data and my cybersecurity applications data and my, you know, and other forms of data. And how do I put those things together to, you know, build a bigger picture of what what's out there to be able to answer, you know, to be able to answer more concise questions of, 
is that access really being used? Does that access, it is, is that access really appropriate anymore by, by looking at the, the metadata around everything around it? It's a, it's a great question. And I would love, I would love an AI to help me do that, but I'm, I'm not there yet. <laughs> it's going to get better, right? I think AI, this is the worst it's ever going to be. It's going to keep getting better from here. And it's already pretty darn cool. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of it. Um, and the good news is you picked three really easy blog topics to get into. So I'm sure it'll be super easy <laughs> to, to come up with different viewpoints. And I'm curious to see you know the, the comments and the feedback. So I'll be looking forward to those. Um, you've been very generous with your time. And it is a Sunday. So why don't you go? You even went, in, you even went into the office to record this. So um, you know, above and beyond. But I have something very important to ask you as a Marvel fan or as a co-Marvel fan. What are your thoughts on Robert Downey Jr. being announced as Dr. Doom coming back to the Marvel Universe? So I'm really curious on whether or not the mask will actually come off. You know, the, when reading the articles and reading the things that they talk about, you know, about Robert Downey Jr. doing, you know, being Dr. Doom. I think the actor has the, you know, has a great ability to play, you know, to be able to play the part. Can he play that villain? Can he play that, you know, that kind of empowered, just like, you know, master of all kind of, you know, kind of character? Absolutely. Robert Downey Jr.'s can knock that, you know, will knock that out of the park. Will they, though, take the mask off? Will, you know, will there be scenes in any way, form or fashion where we really know it's him underneath it in any way, form or fashion? I don't know how they do that. I don't know if they had, I, you know, I would like to think Dr. Doom can't take it off and therefore it's not a, it's not a question, but if there is, you know, are, are we doing a multiverse thing here? <laughs> you know, what's the, you know, what's the, yeah, you know, what's the play? Well, yeah. I mean, he is Iron Man. He told you this, you know, point blank <laughs> to the camera. Right. And then he snapped his fingers. Um, you know, that's that maybe that's a benefit, right? He's used to playing a character with a mask, being an Iron Man. Now, obviously, Tony Stark, you know, pulls the mask off much more frequently than Doctor Doom, and I'm sure they'll take liberties because, uh, it, you know, they have to make a movie kind of out of it. But it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I think, I think it's interesting to have the same actor playing two different roles within the same universe, and how do they explain that? Is it a multiverse angle? <laughs> well. It, you did, you know, if you, you didn't, you know, I don't want to, you know, a little bit of a spoiler if you haven't seen the Deadpool Wolverine movie yet. I have not. Don't spoil it. All I'll say is, is Captain America makes a, you know, makes an, you know, makes an appearance and then you'll see something else happen there too. That'll be, you know, that you'll, that'll come to that same question. Okay. Well, I'm a fan of Deadpool, so um, I'm looking forward to seeing that when I can. Jim, do you have any idea what we're talking about? <laughs> None. None whatsoever. <laughs> Actually, I did know lawn. that there was a Deadpool movie and Wolverine. Just see uh, it for Ryan but, Reynolds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I know that Ryan Reynolds is the Deadpool, so, but that's all I know. Okay. Now I'm kind of like anything else they say is totally uninformed. So when you hear the ter the character Doctor Doom, what comes to mind? Just as somebody no, who's not like, familiar with this. So those comic books were around when I was a kid. So. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with Marvel comic books. And what I've found is like when these movies come out and they have the, these surprising things nobody was expecting, it was in one of those comic books, like number 138 that, I mean, who the heck's going to remember every section of a comic book? So I think the creators go back into the comic books. And one of the things that I am always shocked by is like how dark some of those comic books really got because I didn't realize it when I was a kid and I was collecting them and looking at them, but I wasn't looking at them in the way an adult would look at them, right? To really understand like the subplots. It was just like, you know, looking at them like kids, like, oh, that guy's cool. That guy's a bad guy. I don't like him or whatever. So, but I always think it's neat how they tie it back to a real comic book. And then everybody's like, oh yeah, we should have known that was coming. It's kind of like um, how uh, Game of Thrones tied back to those books and like people who are like really geeked out on the books. What was it like fire and ice or something like that? They'd be like, oh, yeah, they kind of knew what was coming, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, it, it's similar to that. Yeah. Well, it'd be interesting to see you have Dr. Doom. So he's the, the main villain that's opposite of the Fantastic Four. So I know that there's been a Fantastic Four in the past. I don't think it was fantastic, <laughs> but it was it was fine. So I know they're kind of rebooting that, but it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I just thought it was interesting. And, you know, if you've seen the clips at this point, right, Robert Downey Jr. comes on the stage, there's a bunch of different Dr. Dooms, and he pulls off the mask. And then you see him. And this is how they announced it, like Comic-Con or something like that. So it got, it was, it was, it was kind of a cool reveal to be, I guess, maybe if you were in the room and you're like, you know, holy, you know, whatever. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, after him having had such a successful, you know, journey to the whole Iron Man kind of process and into the uh, the Avengers, it's kind of interesting to see how they how they tackle that or if they just ignore it. Like, uh, it's just, it's a different role. So know? aren't there like two lines of comic books? There's like that. And then there's the one where they had like the... What's it, the, the the League of Nations or something? And I remember seeing a commercial now where Aquaman is fighting that one guy who's got like the the yeah. well now you're mixing DC and Marvel. DC and Marvel. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's yeah. I can't keep up with that stuff, man. I don't know how you guys do. DC has not had a successful film background, I would say, with the exception of batman's movies have probably been the best but they haven't really been tied to like a dc universe of like superman wonder woman batman the flash etc those sorts of things i think marvel has definitely done a much better job of getting their characters out there and you know producing good fun films to see wasn't there like a superman versus batman where they were fighting with each other and it was like that was pretty dark wasn't it uh, most of the dc films have been dark i don't know chris about you but i feel like dc tends to be a little bit of a darker <laughs> uh, approach to their characters compared to uh, Marvel. Yeah, DC's always been darker. That, the, it, you know, Marvel's always been, you know, Marvel's always been a little bit more up, being a little more like there's a there's a happy ending to the story kind of thing where in a DC movie, there's no guarantee that the movie doesn't end with people, with everybody dead and, you know, and like, you know, and, you know, and the storm clouds basically, you know, dissipating around the, you know, around the, you know, around the world. That's mm -hmm. a normal, that's a normal look. All right. Well, we got into it. I was curious, Chris, is to see what you would thought about uh, our opportunity to coming back, but let's go ahead and leave it there for this week. Chris, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to have a link in our show notes to your LinkedIn article, connect with Chris on LinkedIn, and, you know, maybe provide some, some fodder for articles coming up or opinions and things like that. Uh, Jim, you and I are on LinkedIn, so definitely connect with us and, you know, send us comments, feedback, et cetera. Uh, we're on the web, idacpodcast.com, Twitter, X, whatever it's called, at IDAC Podcasts. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you so much. Hit that like and subscribe button. That's the best way you can help us out. If you're not watching us on YouTube, do us a favor and jump over to YouTube real quick and, and give us a subscription. That would be fantastic. To make it easy, you can hit idacpodcast.tv. That'll take you right to our channel. And uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and leave it there. Thanks, everyone, for watching and or listening, and we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.